welcome back to another episode of Sploosh. Today, Sarah and I will be looking back at the first Sploosh session that happened, was it last Saturday? Last, last Saturday. Saturday. And sharing our thoughts on like individual performances and spoken word in general. Like, I think this episode is quite cool because I don't think there's been much like spoken word criticism in Singapore. At least not as much as like poetry and prose. You know, recently I read an essay written by Joshua Ip about how this is an area for growth actually. Yeah, in so, Singapore. In Singapore. Yeah. But yeah, maybe we can start off by talking a bit about like what spoken word is because most people don't really know what it means, right? They just use spoken word, poetry slam, open mic, interchangeably. So you just want to like share briefly about it. Okay, well, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> <laughs> spoken word refers to an oral poetic performance art that is mainly based on the poem as well as the performer's aesthetic qualities. Um, it's a continuation of the ancient oral artistic tradition that focuses on the aesthetics of recitation and wordplay, such as the performer's intonation and voice inflection. And unlike written poetry, the poetic text also takes its quality less from the visual aesthetics on a page, mm -hmm. but dispens depends more on phono aesthetics, which I guess probably refers to, you know, like its oral qualities uh -huh. or the aesthetics of sound. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Something I've heard a lot of people say, um, especially when it comes to poetry, especially, you know, like lit teachers in school, uh -huh. is that um, poetry is meant, meant to be, to be read yeah. aloud. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. um, and and I agree. You know, um, I think the experience of reading a poem on the page mm -hmm. and the experience of hearing a performance, uh, sorry, a poem spoken out loud or reading a poem out to yourself, um, really changes or sometimes you know enhances the experience yeah. because you know when you re when you read a poem out loud, you sort of hear more clearly. Um, the rhythm of the poem, mm. you know, the rhyme, the the, tone. the dynamics, yeah. you know, and um, it sort of uniquely conveys something that you mm. can't really feel when you're just, you know, reading the flat words on a page. Yeah. Especially when it comes to, I guess, when you're um, not so much modern poetry, mm. but you know, when it comes to the sorts of poetry that you study in school yeah. or Shakespeare and things uh, like that when they you know constantly drill things like yeah. iambic pentameter yeah. into your head you know Those this is that pays much attention to like meter and rhyme yes exactly and that's the kind of thing you only really understand when you you know read mm. these poems and passages out loud yeah. and you understand how you know all of these technical decisions that mm -hmm. the poet has made it sort of contributes to yeah. your um, understanding of what they're saying and this really stands out in Owen's performance right because he uses rhyme and rhythm to like yes. create effect in that poem about sleep paralysis. And also, I think talking about, you know, like the ancient oral tradition, mm. right? Um, the use of rhyme also reminds me of like, you know, epic poetry. Yeah. Because actually currently I'm reading in a just oh. damn cool, man. <laughs> I would love to hear that being performed out loud one day. Is it like, a, like, is it written in blank verse or something? Or is it just in prose? Blank verse. Ah, okay. Yeah. So the, the writer actually tried to write in like iambic tetrameter. Yeah. Which I think um, I read somewhere that the reason that you know all these ancient epics like these Homerian mm -hmm. epics or like you know the Mahabharata or the yeah. Ramayana were written in verse was so that you know they would be easier to remember yeah. for the bards or the poets or whatever who yeah. are um, like traveling around and traveling around and, and reciting and telling their stories yeah. um, because you know like the rhyme really makes it stick in your head yeah. which is why you know um, like children's nursery rhymes uh -huh. and songs are so uh, you know, like always feature like these very, very simple and catchy rhymes. Yeah. It's like ancient radio. Yeah, e exactly. Um, which is why, you know, you had these like completely blind bards in ancient Greece, uh -huh. like telling s stories at, you know, feasts yeah. for three days straight. Mm -hmm. And um, because of that, you know, like this sort of oral tradition has been able to continue for so long. And like, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of societies, like I think, in you know, like Australian Aboriginals, they, um, this is like a very strong oral tradition, yeah. right? Yeah. But in modern poetry, I think the oral tradition has been like fading, right? Yeah. Like, so I guess like with the poems that we saw performed at mm -hmm. Sploosh session number one, there really was like a varying degree to which mm. um, the poems being read aloud sort of like enhanced yeah. um, your experience of them. So you know, for example, as you mentioned. Uh, Owen's poem, which we'll get to, mm -hmm. um, really made very good use of you know rhythm and rhyme to sort of convey like the overwhelming anxiety wow. of sleep paralysis, and I think I'm really really glad that I got to hear that mm -hmm. spoken out loud, you know, because I think it had like a completely different effect. Yeah, 
than it would have if I just, you know, sort of read it on the page. Mm. But for some of the others, you know, I think I could have gone either way. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing about like spoken word is that it can be quite hard to grasp at times, right? Yeah. Because one of my friends actually gave me feedback that it would be better if they had, you know, the text projected on the screen yeah. while they were reading so they could understand uh, the text better. I think this also goes back to like how we've really lost touch with that oral tradition, you know, because many of the performers actually aren't that confident with performing, you know. To get a point across, to get our audiences to understand the poetry, right, it's not just reading the words, but it's also conveying the emotion, conveying um, the words with your body gesture, with your hand gestures and all. I think that's something that we see in really veteran performers like Pujan yeah. Nancy and Stephanie No, Dockford. I agree. Yeah. Right. Like you could really t- see the difference mm. in, you know, the performances of the poets yeah. who, you know, obviously have been doing this for a while. Mm. And, um, you know, the poets who, like, maybe are performing for the first time mm-hmm. ever, of which, you know, there were quite a few. Yeah. And I think that's actually really cool to see, actually, because, um, you know, the fact that we were able to have, you know, these complete newbies uh-huh. along, you know, these veterans in the same space yeah. was really cool. And I mean, you know, I could all start somewhere. Yeah, I really like that. Also, I guess something else I really liked about our show is the community vibes, you know, especially during break time. Like, people just staying and looking at books. And also, after the show, like, people actually stayed back, you know, to buy books, which is quite impressive because the other spoken word events I've been to, like, people pack usually just in the two minutes. And yeah, I guess it's great that we had, like, different parts of the lit ecosystem on our show. Like, publishers, you know, we had ethos there. Books. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, great. Faith. Okay, so first performance was poem by Faith, right? It was a villanelle. Um, actually, strangely, right? I don't know about you, but I couldn't tell it was a villanelle at first. Because for me, I only heard the rhymes and refrains, but I didn't know it was a villanelle until she said it was a villanelle afterwards. Why couldn't you tell it was a villanelle? <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I'm just not that familiar with the form. Yeah. yeah. But wait, so you were able to tell it was a villanelle? Um, well, honestly, I don't really remember if that, you know, registered with me. <laughs> yeah, but, um, you know, later she, she did say, you know, um, oh, the poem I presented was, yeah. was a villanelle. And yeah. she sort of like explained to the audience, uh-huh. this is what um, a villanelle is and gave some examples. Yeah. Like, um, I think, to not go gently into that good night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think I've read or seen any villanelles mm-hmm. outside of, you know, the sort of, the ones we read in school. Yeah, no, I mean, I, okay, never mind. No, but I, I, I really liked, um, you know, that she, that she managed to, like, use this established form and, mm. like, play around with it a bit. Uh-huh. And I, I really liked her, her reading, you know, she was... Yeah, she's a nice boy. Yeah, she was really sweet. She, yeah. you know, she came out with her, like, her flowy skirt. And, <laughs> and I think it was a really good start to the session. Yeah. Just to, like, Plug a villanelle that I really like. It'd be Pasir is by Tsu Hao Kuang from Beats of Light. That was really good. We interviewed yeah. him before yeah, we on interviewed the podcast. Him. Exactly. Bryce. So next we had Bryce. Bryce was the one who wrote the poem in response to Love After Love, love by Jared after, Walcott. Yes, Love After Love After Love. Yeah. I thought it would, have, it would have been better, you know, if he had sent us his poem so he could have projected both poems on the yeah, screen. Yeah, I agree. Right. Because I, I was listening to his poem and, mm. you know, he said this is a poem after yeah. Derek Walcott, right? And I had, I mean, I'd never heard of that in my life. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe it's, you know, I don't know, maybe it's... I actually tried searching for the poem while, while he was, was reading. reading. Yeah. Like, I just... Yeah, no, but I mean, you can't, you can't focus at, yeah, on exactly. two things at the same time. Um, but but I agree. I think I think we would have gotten a lot more yeah. from it if you know we'd he could have read Walcott's to... first, then read his yes. poem. Yes, but um, I read the poem afterwards. Uh-huh. I think it it mirrors it very well, mm-hmm. you know, as a as response yeah. should. Uh-huh. And I think during our show there were quite a few works that were written in response to other works, right? For example, Stephanie Dockfoot's ah, Malayan poem. the Malayan poem. poem. <laughs> and also Andrew's poem in response to an art piece by Pooja Nancy. Ah, yeah. Right? So I think it's quite amazing that writers are, you know, like, brave enough to say that they're writing in response to other writers. Because I think, like, originality is such a sacred thing when it comes to art, right? But I don't know, I personally think it's so overrated, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> because everything we write is ultimately still in debt to words we have read or other media we have consumed, right? So I think 
having this awareness of like literary lineage is yeah, it's quite inspiring to me. I mean, I think if I was Andrew, I would have been too intimidated to proceed. Andrew, Andrew was so <laughs> amazed, you know, because he didn't know Pusha was coming. Oh really? Yeah. Yeah. It's like a surprise. Exactly. I'm here. I remember the guest, you know, when when I announced that Pusha was going to be the next reader. Yeah. You could hear audible guests from the audience. It's amazing. But yeah, I know. I personally think that well, maybe Bryce didn't really like introduce anything new. About? Oh yeah. Okay. Right. Because I think it was quite similar to Love After Love, but but hey, it's still a poem that could only have been written by him. And I mean, I like. Um, the ending lines, you know. Uh-huh. So I think the the love the last line of love after love is sit feast on your life, mm. and uh, Bryce's was give and you'll be on your way. Mm. That's a bit of a difference here because sit feast on, on your life, life is like staying like, put content, in a state. Yeah, you know, rest give and your life enjoy what is, you have yeah. and give and be on your We're way. Still on a just let go exactly. and you know continue on. Yeah. So you know, I think there was. Mm. There was there was you know a sort of difference in uh-huh. what they were trying to talk about. Yeah. Pooja Nancy. Okay, next. Well, Pooja Nancy. Nancy. What can we say? Our <laughs> secret weapon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You want to start or? Um, I actually really I I really enjoyed listening to her poem. Yeah. I liked um I liked all of her you know like millennial pop culture uh-huh. references, none of which I got. Same. And. <laughs> Possibly, very possibly, you know, given the demographics of our event, you I know, most like, get them yeah, anyway. you're just talking yeah. about like all the rap yeah, and uh, the, me, I'm a fly, I'm super duper fly, and yeah, I, we I just don't. laughed along. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know, and I think it's is really like testament to her ability as a performer that hmm. we all knew. Okay, this is when we had yeah. to laugh, and you know, it's still kind of hit hard, uh-huh. even though you know, I I was basically lacking context to all of it. Hmm. I think it was really great that she, you know, like showed up and was... <laughs> <laughs> she showed up. I mean... But yeah, I was really impressed by her delivery. It was just so assured, you know. And she she you managed to form a connection with the audience. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And yeah, I think also the theme is quite relatable, you know, talking about intergenerational differences and whether they're really that different. Because, you know, in recent times, we have Gen Zs calling you know, adults okay boomers, and then boomers thinking millennials don't want to work, you know, the quiet quitting trend, right? And then yeah. thinking that Gen Zs are snowflakes simply because they want to use pronouns. Then, so we have like, we think that we are so different, but I think in her performance, right, Pooja questioned how different we really are. Um, because like, she references an article that states that there's a new trend among Gen Z, just the use of was it old digital cameras? Film cameras. Film cameras. Yeah. And actually, you know what? The thing is, <laughs> two years ago, I had a classmate of mine who actually used film cameras to take like graduation yeah. photos. I think film cameras uh, are really coming back. Into yes. Vogue. Like past few years, yeah. you know, I think um, the number of people around me who have you know, bought film cameras uh-huh. and started shooting on film mm. uh, has really like risen exponentially. And, and then, you know, with that comes a lot of people saying, ah, oh, you know, like shooting on film doesn't make you better. It's just, uh-huh. you know, and then now there are all these think pieces about um, why Generation Z is so drawn to film cameras yeah. and what that says about like instant gratification and like oh. you know learning yeah because you know as opposed to your phone where uh-huh. you can just take your photo and take like 50 burst yeah. shots and then review and you know delete all of them uh-huh. with a film camera you basically only have one, one shot, shot um, and you don't know what it's what your photo is going to mm. look like until, until you it's produced right. it's produced and um, yeah I mean I think for us Film cameras are still something of a of a novelty, right? Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, I'm shooting this on film. Yeah. It's the like, same with like eighties music as well, because yeah. like it's all the same with Stranger Things, right? Like because it's also set in like the seventies and eighties. Yeah. And the most recent season, you know, saw the revival of Kid Bushes running up the hill. <laughs> it's crazy. And also like Dua Lipa's disco music, you know. It's I think this reminds me of like a quote um, by Robert Yeo. Because he keeps repeating this phrase that nothing is new except what is forgotten. It's yeah. so like for Gen Z, right? Maybe we have forgotten the film camera and <laughs> disco music. But then now that we're rediscovering it, it's like it's coming back in vogue. To like a 30 year cycle, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, and I guess the reason that shows like Stranger Things uh-huh. and 
all these you know like 80s nostalgia yeah. art, um, pieces that are coming out is because you know now all the people who grew up in the 80s are like in their 40s uh-huh. <laughs> and so now they're in like positions of power to, oh yeah you know like um produce all these creative projects uh-huh. and so now they're all like nostalgic for their childhood yeah you know i mean and we see this happening like every decade right like mm. you always see like nostalgia for like maybe like 30 years ago yeah. but you know now with like the internet and all that and you know how fads come and go so much uh-huh. faster and how you know you have like trends and then you have micro trends yeah and you have uh you know all these things we sort yeah. of like are speed running uh-huh. through all these different eras yeah. i guess some people call them i mean just the other day i saw someone like being nostalgic for the early 2000s i was like what <laughs> it's a thing actually, you know <laughs> I keep seeing this Twitter account actually dedicated to the 2000s, you know, the Britney Spears music videos, <laughs> performances. I think, you know, I mean, it was, it was cool hearing what she had to say on, uh-huh. you know, all the kids these yeah. days and their film cameras uh-huh. too big for their boots. <laughs> yeah. I think it's really cool how, like, despite all these changes, right, there's still so many continuities. Like, I remember, because she's quite into music, right, and then she talks about um, a few rap artists, you know, Snoop Dogg, Mr. Elliot, then... Cardi B. You know, they're all from the same genre, but it's musicians that appeal to different generations, Half right? Generations, yeah. yeah. But it was just so funny to hear her talk about wet ass pussy. I think the pop up pussy. Yeah. And yeah, I really I mean, like how her. she's also, you know, st- getting mm. staying with the times. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. I really liked her, you know, just an ode to music because Music for her is able to, you know, bring her back to the past. You know, she has a line that says, bodies come alive when listening to old school music. Music will find you however long you live, which is, yeah, really beautiful. It's true. It's true because yeah. even people with, like, dementia, right, are still able to remember Respond tunes. Respond to music, yeah. you know, more so than they are to, yeah. you know, like, the voices of their uh-huh. family members. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, like, across our, our session, we mm. had quite a few poets talking about, you know, their long lost relationships and uh-huh. you know, intergenerational differences. I yeah. think there was um, there was Shannis and there was Ariane who was talking about, you know, grief. Mm-hmm. And then there and was, was I think Alice, Elise as Elise. well. Elise. Yeah. Yeah, there are quite a lot of similarities actually throughout the poems. I think another one is also the the morning of the loss of dialect. Because yeah. that is something you see in Steph's and Elise's and Shanice's books. A bit, yeah. Yeah. Okay, but let's go on to <laughs> Owen. <laughs> Owen. Yeah, I actually like that he prefaced this poem, you know, by introducing that it's based on a true experience. Because not all the open micers actually talked about their poems, which I think they should, because we give them five minutes, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, some of them were really quite short. I think one of them was Rice's under was a minute. minute. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought it was really impressive, you know, that he was able to memorize his poem. It's quite long, he right? Took one, and and he, spent, he, he said took one, one week, week to memorize it. Yeah, he memorized it in one week. And he's still in NS, right? Which is, wow, amazing. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it goes back to what you said earlier, right, about uh, the oral tradition of poetry, about bards recite, memorizing these poems because they had rhyme and rhythm, right? Like, um, I don't know, epic poems, you know, they use like dactylic hexameter. You know, What's that? You no, know, the one that is used in those Aeneid and like... But what, what does that mean? What does that mean? Okay. Hexa is six. Hexa is six, right? Yes. So there are six feet in, uh-huh. within that line. And... Dactylic is like long, short, short, or long, long. Ah. So you sort of like get into the rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. But it gets kind of tiring, doesn't it? After a while. You're just talking and talking and talking. And it's just the same meter again and again. But I mean, I guess that's what helps you to memorize it so well because you know it's you sort of like fall into the mm-hmm. motions of it and then you can just keep plotting. Yeah. It's like walking, you know. Like uh-huh. I feel you don't ever really get tired of walking. Do you get tired of walking? <laughs> that is a very weird question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I don't I get, get tired walking sometimes. Like as in if it's hot, yeah, I guess. But like if the weather is fine, like I feel I don't really get tired of walking because you know the rhythm is so constant i can just walk forever you're just like uh one foot ahead of the other it comes to you so naturally it's just like breathing like when you get conscious of it then it feels weird like forget how to walk and breathe and 
Yeah. So, I mean, that's the same thing with like all these like regular meters, mm. right? Like you just you just go on yeah. and on and on and on, which is why again, you know, like it's so easy to mm. remember yeah. like rhyming poems, like they just stick in your head, like uh -huh. children's nursery rhymes, yeah. or even things like um, remember, remember the something night to remember. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or um, yeah, I remember when I was in primary school, yeah. we had to like perform some poems. And uh, one of them was about this guy's ice cream shop. It was called mm. Blizzard's Ice Cream. And he essentially, the whole thing was about this guy um, working in an ice cream shop. Uh -huh. And he just sold all these like nonsense flavors. Mm. So there's like coca, mocha, macaroni, tapioca, smoked bologna, checker, berry, <laughs> cheddar, chew, chicken, cherry, what honeydew, tutti frutti, <laughs> stewed tomato, tuna, taco, baked potato, lobster, lychee, lima bean, mozzarella, langoustine. And like goes on mm. and on and on. And like the whole thing is just like nonsense. Yeah. You know, it's just like nonsense combinations of food. Like but Nick it's so trap. catchy. Yeah. Yeah, we should it's... get a rapper next time, actually. <laughs> I really want to feature a rapper. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so, so, um, so I think, like we said earlier, like Owen's poem really, mm. really benefited from being spoken aloud just because yeah. of you know, his very skillful use of like, use of like rhyme and mm. repetition mm. and how you know, the poem would, would, would speed up. You know, he would shorten his lines mm. and his sentences and um, the brands would be more yeah. quicker. And, then, and you, and could, you feel could feel the accents on certain Yeah, you things. could feel the accents and you could feel like sort of like the overwhelming sense of anxiety yeah. that he was uh -huh. feeling when he was confronted with sleep paralysis, uh, yeah. you know, and I think um, it was it was kind of like a stress-inducing poem. And you, I felt stressed listening to yeah, him. Yeah, listening to him talk. And yeah. He would speed up and then he would slow down mm. and then you would sort of catch a break and then the sleep paralysis yeah. would come back. And he would say, you know, I'm here, there's uh, fear. Yeah. Like, well. <laughs> you know? Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. But yeah. Andrew Davidson. Andrew Davidson. So Andrew was one of our... Featured. featured poets. Yes. And I think, unlike Owen, right, because Andrew wrote page poetry, so mm. it's not like it's meant to be read out loud. It wouldn't be enhanced by being read out loud. But strangely enough, I found that his words actually work quite well, you know, being read out loud. Because I actually read um, two of his poems which he performed prior to his performance, so like the viola cello bass poem, as well as the Why Are You Lying at the Wing of the Heart uh -huh. poem. And I actually gained a better appreciation of those poems when he read them out loud. Yeah. I don't know if that's because it's my second time encountering them, but yeah, I was really amazed because usually when people read like page poems, it's just kind of inaccessible, I feel. Yeah. But it's not the same for Andrew, at least for most of his performances. At least I feel that um, um, I think it comes again from experience and his familiarity with his poems mm -hmm. you know so again like I was saying you know this is similar in that there was sort of like a flash mob going on where oh. our poets were just sort of like scattered around the room uh -huh. I don't actually know who Andrew was before he got up uh -huh. and was like um, hey I'm here to read my poems but um, he was sitting quite close to me mm -hmm. and what I saw him doing like for the entire first half was like stitching yeah. the chat books uh -huh. Right, yeah. very like calmly and nonchalantly, mm -hmm. you know, just like sewing the yeah. chapbooks and like folding them together. Mm -hmm. And then later he got up and he had this like whole fat stack of yeah. poems to read and was just like, okay, you know, um, this is how I've ordered them and these mm -hmm. are the poems gonna read. And you know, just like very on the fly, uh -huh. just like, ah, oh, this is what this poem's about and yeah. now I'm gonna read it to you. And I think there was, you know, like an appropriate amount of like, levity mm. but also gravitas yeah. in all the poems mm. and and it, and you know sort of like the appropriate emphasis mm. on the lines that you're supposed to you yeah. know maybe think about a bit more uh -huh. yeah it was really great yeah like even though i think most of the imagery is quite enigmatic right? and, and music quite just grotesque very sometimes it reminds me of symbolism you know like the the art movement the literary movement in which like writers and artists just come up with random symbols that only they understand. Like even though those poems were so like personal to him, I think he was still able to relate to his audience. Yeah, somehow amazingly. Yeah, there was a lot of like bodily imagery, yeah. right? A lot of like meat and mm. like blood. I think this is something and... that I've seen in many works by you know trans poets because Andrew is a trans poet, and I've also watched performances by Loon Lo, who's mm -hmm. also another trans poet, right? And both their works actually engage a lot with the idea of the body and ideas of alienation as well. And 
I guess that's why I really, really liked that line in which um, Andrew said, I want to strip the body of its materiality, this tunnel I cannot see my way through. When I was sitting there listening to this, I really just felt like my body really was a tunnel <laughs> and I'm somehow like just trapped within this frame, you know. And yeah, that's just how amazing it was. And also, as I'm talking about the last poem now, right? Why you're lying at the la- wing of my heart, of the heart. Mm-hmm. I really found the opening images so beautiful because it was the unclarity of water, then somehow light reflecting through the medium and then like roots spreading. It's very peaceful. Yeah, like it is nat- very peaceful. You know, like the natural world. Yeah. And it's enhanced by his delivery as well because his yeah. voice is really so, so soothing. I also like the, the seed poem. I don't know. Yeah, wordplay, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I was really listening to it just now and the way he read like some seed fell on me, I don't think it was yours. I think I'm going to do something new. Do I have any choice but to, but to sing if I can't stop singing, if I can't stop sinking? I don't know why, but it reminded me so much of Sylvia Plath. Mm-hmm. For some reason. Maybe the cadence and also like the confessionalism of it. Yeah. Mm, otherwise, yeah, we talked about the poem that he wrote in response to Kusha Nancy's art piece, which yeah. uh, I'm not, I've never seen. But also he had other like many really yeah. um, no, I think, obscure cultural references yeah. that none of us got. None of us got. <laughs> yeah. you, you could tell that, you know, this is something that meant something, mm. but you were just like, oh, okay. Yeah, but I think um, the strength of his poetry really was, you know, sort of the images that he used. Yeah, which made me want to grab a copy of the text afterwards. Yeah, so. just to, you know, like go and cross-reference yeah. and to see, oh, well, you know, like what, what was that all mm-hmm. about? Shanice. Okay, next poet, Shanice. Would you like to talk about her? Yeah, so um, Shanice came on like right after our break mm. where, uh, you know, people had been going down to buy drinks, uh-huh. buying books, and we like rearranged some of the tables as well, mm. you know, so more people could sit. Yeah. And so I think people weren't really like settled yet. Mm-hmm. And I think even when she was sort of like just standing up there ready to speak after she'd been introduced, people were still sort of like a bit restless and talking among themselves. But the moment she said her first line, the mo- actually the moment she introduced herself, the moment she said, hi, yeah. I'm Shannis, and uh, this is a poem about my grandfather mm. and dementia. I think you could tell that like the focus of the whole yeah. room sort of like shifted. She was so confident. Right? I was really surprised. Yeah. And um, considering that she's also like in JC mm. and you know, the whole place is like full of adults yeah <laughs> i think that was um i think it was quite cool that she had you know that sort of like confidence mm. and a strength in her voice yeah uh so actually this poem she read mm-hmm. i read like the previous version of it i think two years ago and she posted it on her oh she's been editing it for yeah. two years. <laughs> wow uh, when she posted it on her you know her instagram poetry uh-huh. account you know like as you do mm. And um, I guess she edited it quite a bit mm-hmm. to, you know, perform out loud for Sploosh and like, yeah. you know, revised it or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think the difference between the original version and the version that she performed on Saturday mm-hmm. was really that it had a lot more um, personal details. So it's more relatable. Um, yeah, it's sort of like, uh, it's more intimate, you know, it mm. sort of like really draws you in to yeah. the changes she was seeing in her grandfather and mm. how, you know, that made her feel. Yeah. Um, so instead of just, you know, like all these like very abstract ideas about like mm. absinthe and gerontology, yeah. <laughs> you know, she would talk about um, like her grand- Well, the trains was uh-huh. the original, you know, like hook for it. Yeah. But, you know, she would talk about like her grandfather eating vegetables uh-huh. and things like that. Yeah. Um, which just makes the whole thing, you know, all the more affecting mm. or like heartbreaking. Actually, I submitted a poem recently, right? And then the editor got back to me uh-huh. saying that poems about the dying grandmother have been done so many <laughs> times. So you could actually, so you can actually neglect the narrative parts and focus on the elements that make your granny an individual. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I think, um, you know, like you see this said a lot about like writing and mm. literature and things like that. Like saying, like talking, when you're talking about a war, right? Mm. Like talking about the hundreds of people dead yeah. um, doesn't really do much yeah. because, you know, it's just like, it's very amorphous and um, big and it's too big to comprehend. Yeah. But then when you talk about like maybe like one tattered like a, yeah. dress or like a pair of shoes or something, uh-huh. that small like micro image is so much more affecting. Mm. Yeah, so... Um, I think her her delivery was not quite in line with sort of what the poem was about, just because, you know, her voice was so like yeah. confident and strong and she mm. was just 
reading it, you could feel that she was quite sincere well, she about it. Was overcompensating for nervousness, maybe? Yeah, right. but it was it was a really good poem to bring mm. us back from the break. Yeah, I really liked the ending line actually. I began um, to imagine wearing you from the back, carrying you just so far away from this lonely, lonely room where we used, used to, to watch, watch trains. trains. Yeah, because she started the poem with the hook about trains, right? Yeah. Watching trains, and she ended with trains as well. I just feel like, you know, it's really heartfelt, and I really like such, you know, unpretentious writings. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Agree. It's very unpretentious. Yeah. Um, next, Christian. Christian Yo. I think the vibes I got from this poem was like. Talking about the relationship between someone with anxiety, I think the persona, and also the lover who can provide comfort. You know, there's this line that says, tomorrow will worry about itself. And also, there's this image of his lover watering the plants despite their dying, right? It's this kind of expression of love, um, providing care, which is also what, the lo- what his lover does for him, I guess. And also, actually, it's quite interesting that um, he talks about the caring for plants, you know, in this poem because Pooja Nancy, I think, wrote about it also in a poem she wrote about, like, um, you know, pandemic plants, something about them. company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, I guess this really, like, makes me realise that maybe uh, in our isolation during the pandemic, we kind of sought comfort in the presence of, like, living things um, near us, like people got house plants and pets. But that's a but they may be irresponsible pet owners now. But yeah, that's all I have to say that for this poem. Yeah. I also like the line, uh, like the sort of like meta self aware line. He uh-huh. was like, Oh, you know, I water the dying plants, I tell her it's a metaphor and she wraps me on the top of my head and says, uh, is, is that a, a metaphor? metaphor? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, that got quite a lot of la- laughs from yeah. the audience. Aryan. Well the next performer was also really confident, you know, Aryan. Yeah, I think and Aryan's quite new as mm. in quite young right yeah he's 19 yeah it's a very long poem <laughs> would you like to share more about it um i say first now. yeah um i mean as in i think it was it was quite long and i sort of got lost in it mm. and um but somehow after the entire show right i agreed with like my friends that Aaron actually gave a good performance, even though I have no recollection of what the performance was about. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it was a very long performance. Yeah. Um, it was quite a long poem, and it, it was, it was, I think, like a meditation on grief, mm. and, you know, I guess, obviously quite personal to yeah. him. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great performance. It was a great performance. Elise. Elise was the only one who performed a prose piece. Actually, it was me who asked her to perform a prose piece because she DM'd us and I said, Oh, everyone is doing poetry. Do you want to do prose? And she's like, Okay, yeah, sure. And I think it was kind of good. I actually liked the prose piece because it was like quite fresh also. Uh, everyone else performing poems, you know. And then here is something that it's more easy to understand, right? But I think the biggest shortcoming would be that it was too long. Okay, honestly, I, I would not have known that it was a prose piece oh. if Laura Jane had not explicitly said, like, This is a prose piece. <laughs> You thought like a prose poor maybe. Yeah. No, just because I think when like people are delivering spoken word, there's a sort of like cadence yeah. that they fall back into. Uh-huh. And um, you know, because like poetry is like, you know, what is poetry? Anything yeah. is poetry. Uh-huh. You know, and you can't really like see the line breaks mm-hmm. in front of you when someone is reading out a poem. Yeah. So honestly, like I would not have been able to tell. Mm-hmm. But um, you know, again I think she she had sort of like similar ideas. With Shannis about you know like losing yeah. losing touch with her A grandparents, um, but not because you know they had dementia, but more mm. because of like language barriers mm. and you know, like cultural distances. Yeah, like there's this line, um, "Xiang nian ta ma," which means "Do you miss him?" I ask, and I almost worry that my colonized tongue will lapse beyond this understanding. And this is a struggle that um, Shannis also kind of alludes to, and also staff later in her performance. Yeah. yeah. And so I think, you know, both poems sort of have that idea of um, there's something that's standing between us mm. and our ability to relate to each other. Yeah. But then at the end of it, there's also like the reconciliation, right? Uh-huh. So, you know, like Shannon says, um, none of us speak your language anymore. But mm. then later she says, my heart makes the same noise as you. Yeah. I think Alice also has something like that. I think, right, um, yeah. it's amazing that we have 
works that are written partially in other languages, but it would be better if we could show like the translation um, concurrently because otherwise it would be quite alienating for. Yeah, no, I think what Elise did is she actually did translate. Yeah, she did, but not for um, every single. She did, she did. So she did translate all of it. Oh. Um, but I think the problem with that was it sort of like broke up the flow of her yeah. poem. So I think like towards the end of her poem, she had this like chunk that was in Chinese. The the final line. Yeah, and I think she realized that you know um, like not everyone in the audience mm. would be able to understand. So she 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 sort of said, oh, but that means blah 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 blah. Yeah. And that sort of like broke up the floor before yeah. a little bit. Yeah, so it will be good if, you know, next time we can screen it mm. behind. Yeah. Mahima. Okay, next. The final open micer, Mahima. So Mahima's actually my friend and I've read the eight poem before. Uh-huh. Yeah, and yeah, my friends and I really love that poem because like the image is just so striking, you know. Like, my friend actually asked how she came up with that image and she said it actually happened. But, oh my god, she has such poise when it came yeah. to delivery. I was just she so... She looks like a princess. Yes! You know, I was like just standing so amazed. There. Yeah. Yeah, it was just marvellous, man. It's quite a natural. Yeah. I really like, you know, the final line, I think. He turned 18 and an unborn embryo kissed his face. It was only right for him to press it back so gently, so gently. Yeah. And also, there's another line I really like, you know, this, just the sounds and words that she used, like picking eggshells and making the sharp ends register on his palms like penitence, like penance. And <laughs> maybe it's basic alliteration and sibilance, but it's, yeah, I mean, I just love the sound. And also, I mean, we're talking about this, that spoken word is meant to be heard, right? And yeah, I just like the way that she said those words and the way I those words enter my ears. Yeah. It was a pleasant experience. It was it really was a pleasant. pleasing experience. It was pleasant and pleasing to listen to penitence and penance. I think, again, um, as with, I think you said about Shannis's mm. poem, right? Her, her writing is very unpretentious. Yes. You know, and I think um, a lot of it starts with like maybe like personal experiences of mm. hers. I think one of her poems started with kneeling at the pond in our pinafores and trying to catch a frog or something like that. Mm. And then, you know, she sort of like develops the idea into something more. Mm. But the second poem, actually, I kind of got lost. Do you get lost? A bit. Yeah, I felt I was a bit protracted, but then it also makes sense in the context of the poem because she keeps saying that uh, she wants a happy ending or something, right? And then in the end, she does get the happy ending, but it's this so long. Yeah, but again, it was just pleasing to listen to. She was really pleasing to listen to. Yeah. And also, it's a really interesting... Um, subject matter, I guess. And she was talking about insects, right? Right. Which is really cool. Most people don't write about insects. I think it's funny that she said, would you love me if I was a worm? Yeah. <laughs> Wait, actually, you know, a friend told me afterwards that that line actually stuck with him because he had actually asked his ex that question before. Would you love me if I was a worm? Just, yeah, really cool. And that friend of mine actually doesn't really appreciate poetry. Uh-huh. So I was actually quite touched that he was able to, you know, have Connect lines that start with yeah. yeah, that's great. Stephanie Dogfoot. Mm, okay, la, let's just move on to the final performer, which is our second featured performer, Stephanie Dogfoot. So would you like to talk more about her? Yeah, I think, okay, so originally, um, I think Stephanie Dogfoot was supposed to perform before the break. Mm. But due to unforeseen circumstances, kind of foreseen, <laughs> unforeseen circumstances, uh, she ended up performing last, last. which was a good and call, actually. Yes, which I think ended up being a really, really great mm. decision. Yes, well, not so much of a decision, but a really great thing. <laughs> good decision um, on her part. <laughs> yeah, because I guess you know she's like one of the most veteran, veteran yes. spoken word poets. Yeah, it's really cool that you know she was able to come for yeah. our. Uh, session mm. and ended off on such a high note. Yeah, you know, like the the energy and the humor and mm. like you know, like the skill of the delivery. Yeah, it was just it was just really great. It was so you know she started off saying um, my apologies to Amanda Chong and Alfian Saad, mm-hmm. and immediately I was like, oh, I know what this is no. <laughs> <laughs> because. Um, <laughs> Okay, it's a very long story, yes. and I'm not going to go into why, or I'm not going to go into it. But um, I watched the sort of like the Malayan poem mm. on YouTube in mm-hmm. I think 2019 mm. in in June or July or something like that, and I thought it was like 
super hilarious. Mm -hmm. You know, it was it's so funny. <laughs> yeah. And um, in 2019, you know, when I read the poem, I was doing like a singlet poetry module in school uh -huh. uh, where we read a lot of Malayan poems, uh -huh. you know. So we read Edwin Thambu, we read like okay. Ameda Chong's poem, we read Musing on the Malayan Myth, which is by Grace Chia. Mm -hmm. You know, so we read a lot of Malayan poems. Wait, actually, which work by Amanda Chong was she referencing? It's the one that's ins inscribed on the Helix Bridge, if I'm not oh. wrong. I think. So it's in professions. I think so. I've read it before. Okay. It's called Lionheart or something oh, like that. Okay. Okay, anyway, you're not important. But yes, digressing. Yeah, again. digressing. Um, yeah, it's just like a hilarious poem. And I remember actually like going to the Malayan a couple of years later, like, oh. like you the Malayan. Yes. And I was thinking, oh, you know, there are like so many poems about Malayans. Mm. But I think Steph Dogford's one is like my favorite one, especially oh. since it's so like, um, like self-aware and it mm. like explicitly takes all these lines from like these like famous Malayan poems yeah. and just says, oh, you know, what if we took like this, uh, you know, like na national narrative mm. myth and whatever and we, you know, just sort of like, uh, crumpled it up. Yeah. It was just like, haha, whatever. You know, so it sort of starts um, like talking about like the grandeur of the mm. Malayan and saying, you know, the Malayan is so big and yeah. so tall and so grand, this like sun dappled skills, which, if I'm not wrong, is actually borrowed from, I think, like Edwin Thambu's poem, I'm not mm. sure. And like, sort of like the exaltation of the Malayan. Mm. And then, sort of like, um, and you think, okay, you know, this is a good poem, but. Uh, you know, same old, same old. Mm -hmm. I've heard this before. And yeah. then I think, like, about a third in, you hear, the Malayan is a monument to interspecies relationships. And then you think, <laughs> huh? Okay, maybe there's like a metaphor here. <laughs> you know, so, so, so I mean, uh, what the, I think the line before the interspecies line mm -hmm. is like, oh, we cover you in concrete, uh -huh. just like we cover everything in country in this country with yeah. concrete. And then you're like, oh, okay, this is going to be like a boohoo Singapore poem. Uh -huh. You know, and then it's like interspecies. And then you're like, huh? Yeah. You're like, where is this going? <laughs> and then it just sort of like goes off the rails a bit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a call and response, of course, yeah. which I think um, the audience responded yeah. really well to. Mm -hmm. And then it just kind of becomes a bit ridiculous mm. you know it's like Malayan I want to I think the Malayan I wish you had pause or mm. I want to give you a hug is from Alfian Saad's poem oh. but then it takes it one step further that's mm. like Malayan I want to make love with you yeah. you know and then it just it just becomes so ridiculous mm -hmm. um, I think it's like perfect for for you know spoken word yeah it is because um, like the delivery really is key you know mm. reading on the page is like okay yeah. haha you know it's like something funny mm -hmm. but this is some, but sort of like the humor of the poem is something mm. you, can, you can really only do when yeah. you you know use that ironic tone of voice and, <laughs> and you make it clear to yeah. the audience that like I'm in on this joke mm -hmm. with you I really liked the part where she talked about danger and she said it's okay I like, I like danger <laughs> I love that oh my god yeah. that's amazing I think the delivery really was like 50% yeah. of it and really like sold the poem mm. So actually, she told us afterwards that she intended this for a bad spoken word night. Uh, like it was meant to fit a bad spoken word theme. <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah, which is funny. Yeah, which it does I, I guess like you sort of get because it's so like melodramatic, and it mm. is pastiche, you know, because yeah. it like takes all these other lines uh -huh. and just sort of like makes a mockery yeah. of all of them. And also, it does everything that you know those conventionally successful spoken word performances do. You know, it feels almost like stand-up comedy even, yeah. right? Yeah. There's the, you know, there's the audience interaction, uh -huh. there's like the dramatic pauses, yeah. there's the, oh, I'm so angry, I'm so <laughs> miserable and everything. Yeah. Yeah, and so I really, really enjoyed that yeah. performance of the Malayan poem. I am I'm glad so we glad I got to hear it, it like, as well. Yeah. But yeah, and then, okay, I mean, the other poems. <laughs> other poems are also fantastic. I yeah, think. they're also fantastic yeah. as well. I think the two poems about myth, right? Yeah. One about Medusa and then the other one about, about Hans Christian Mermaid. Anderson, yeah. yeah. I like the Medusa one. I like the contrast between, you know, turning men to stone and turning men to women to water, just because, you know, that contrast is so huge you know, between solid and liquid. And also, it's a nice lesbian twist to the myth, yeah. And I think there's the same queer undertones for like, Little Mermaid as well, because I think she introduced it yeah. to us, right? That Hans Christian Andersen was actually writing for this guy he had a crush on. Yes, yeah, a prince, you yeah. know, who he could never Did be he with. He imagined himself as the Little Mermaid. Yes, so is, that's yeah. actually what it was about, you know. He yeah. desperately wanted to be with the prince, but uh -huh. he could never be. Yeah. So, you know, he's the mermaid, yeah. uh, stuck in the water. Yeah. And then, you know, the only way to get with the prince is 
you know, it's it's so difficult. It's almost impossible, yeah. you know. And then the the mermaid ends up, and the original story ends up mm. with you know this like thousands of years of like repentance that she has to do. Serious? Yeah. Um, I don't know the story. Uh, so what happens at, in this in the story is that. Um, so she's she's like in love with the prince, uh-huh. but the prince is on a boat, like yeah. ready to marry like this his other hot chick, okay. and um and she's like crying on the boat mm-hmm. because you know her time is almost up. Her sister suddenly like emerge, and they say we chopped off all of our hair, mm-hmm. it made a deal with the sea witch, mm-hmm. and we've gotten like this knife that you can use, mm-hmm. um and the only way for you to s- not be cursed or whatever it is, or for you not to have to turn into sea foam. Mm-hmm. Oh, whatever it is, you have to take the knife and you have to go and kill the prince while he's sleeping. But the little mermaid, of course, is still so besotted with him, even mm. though she can never be with him. Yeah. Um, she's completely unable to do it. So I think on the eve of the third day or something, she sort of like just like lets herself... I'm not sure what she becomes. I think she becomes like an air spirit, uh-huh. some sort of spirit, and she has to work for the angels wow. or work for God for like, I think, maybe a thousand years. And Wait, this is completely different from the Disney Little Yes, Mermaid. it is completely <laughs> different. There, there's, there's no happy ending, you know. Oh, so you can, oh you can really see like sort of like the pining that Hans Christian Andersen yeah. felt. And at the end of it, he was, you know, I mean, obviously he couldn't get with the prince. Mm. And he just had to like toil in silence. Yeah. Uh, you know, like motivated by his love. So, mm. you know, there is that like queer undertone in the original anyway. Mm. But as for the poem itself, I really liked like the meta element where yeah. instead of Hans Christian Andersen writing about the mermaid, it's mm. like the mermaid writing about Hans Christian Andersen. Yeah. And they're like both writing about each other yeah. and like trying to like shape each like, other's even stories. Even the sea is writing stories as well. Yeah. And um, so I think there was also, you know, like that element of humor in it. Mm. She was like, oh, you know, A is writing about B and B is writing yeah. about A. And they're both like, they both realize that it's like totally futile mm. because, you know, neither of them is going to get a happy ending. Or both uh-huh. of them have the power to like write themselves a happy ending. Yeah. But also, you know, still very like touching and mm. all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, on to the last poem. She was quite forgettable, more than I agree. I think, okay, I think it was funny that, um, like, she talked about, like, I think you written it here, actually, she mm. only calls herself, like, Teochu when she orders the porridge. Mm. And again, it was a callback to, you know, like, all of the, like, lost identity, yeah. intergenerational tensions mm-hmm. and all that that was touched on by our other poets. Yeah. It's funny, yeah, but also it's, it's tinged with sadness like, and regret because... Is it the same for like the Indian and Malay communities in Singapore? No, right? Like what? Like losing dialects. Not dialects, mm. but maybe more like individual like identities. Oh. Like for example, like for the Malay community, mm. like everyone in Singapore is just like Malay. But then mm. you know there are like yeah. Javanese, Boyanese, uh-huh. like this, that, this, yeah. you know, like um, the indigenous groups of like southern areas mm. and like that kind of thing. It's the same for like similar for the Chinese community, I guess. Yeah. Because because we no longer identify as like what Hakka, Hakka Teochew. Yeah, yeah, because of you know like the the, the government right? yeah. mother tongue policy. Yeah, where you know there are no more dialects because yeah. we need to like unify everyone uh-huh. under a united like Chinese identity. Yeah. It's actually quite interesting. Like I remember I was reading, I saw this picture of like a census record from. Uh-huh. I think maybe like the 1960s, mm-hmm. where there were actually more Hindi speakers in Singapore than there were like Mandarin speakers, wow. which is like totally insane when you think it about is. it now, right? So people were like, speaking dialects back yeah, then. Yeah, so, so uh, there were like plenty of like Teochew, mm. Cantonese, Hakka, Hokkien, whatever speakers, yeah. but there was like a vanishingly small like amount of Mandarin, Mandarin Chinese speakers. Yeah. So even more than Mandarin Chinese, there was like uh, Punjabi, Gujarati, Hindi, mm. whatever, you know, and like Tamil, of course. Whoa. And now, of course, you know, it's all those groups have been like subsumed into the larger like Chinese yeah. identity. I also feel like we're, so, we're in a sort of dialect revival, actually, at least for the Chinese community, mm. because I don't I know many friends who are interested in learning dialects. And also, I think the government is less strict on clamping down on dialects. Yeah, now. but I mean, what has been lost has been lost. Yeah. Like, you know, that's not repairable. Mm. Like, it's sad that I can understand my grandparents when they speak in. Um, Cantonese, but I can't really speak to them in Cantonese fluently. Yeah. yeah. And also, I guess, you know, for how much we love globalization, right? Okay, I mean, I don't love globalization, <laughs> but for how idealistic we can be when we think of like global citizens, you know, Albert Einstein being like a citizen of the world or yeah. something, um, I think people still crave that sense of rootedness, right? Wanting to be in a tribe of their own, yeah, 
which is quite interesting to think about like the practicalities of such ideal such idealistic visions. That's all I have to say for the Teochew poem. Yeah. Um, so now we've talked about the 11 performers that we had at Spoosh session number one. Mm -hmm. We all had a really, really great time. Yeah. We're super grateful for the people who helped us to make this possible, including Ethos Books and Crane, our venue. Yeah. And of course, you know, like super grateful to our featured poets, mm -hmm. um, Andrew Davidassen and Stephanie Dogfoot mm -hmm. and Puja Nancy, of course. <laughs> and the other open micers. And the other open micers for, you know, coming and making this a possibility. And we are very encouraged by this first session and yeah. can't wait to see what happens at Sploosh session number two. Yeah. But yes, thank you and goodbye. Bye bye. Sploosh.